Introduction to Quantum Information Processing. Welcome to Lecture 21, which is about the Bell inequality in physics. The version that we'll consider was discovered shortly after John Bell's groundbreaking paper and is called the CHSH inequality after its authors Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt. I'd like to begin by making a distinction between fresh randomness and stale randomness. By stale randomness, I mean something like this. Suppose that I flipped the coin yesterday, and I know what the outcome was, but I'm not telling you what the outcome was. Then, from your perspective, the outcome is a probability distribution. From your perspective, the outcome is heads with probability a half and tails with probability a half. But the outcome is already determined. Your probabilities just reflect a lack of information. Contrast this situation with the case where the coin is spinning in the air right now. In that case, neither of us know the outcome. The outcome has not been determined yet. Let's call that fresh randomness. But is a coin flip really a random process? Isn't the outcome determined by the present conditions? If we knew the exact shape of the coin, its exact motion, and the positions of all the air molecules, and we had an extremely powerful computer, then maybe we could determine the value of the coin flip while it's spinning in the air. Moreover, it could be argued that even if we cannot determine the outcome in advance, the outcome is still something that's determined in advance. It's a matter that could be debated. A similar question arises with predicting the weather. Is the outside temperature one year from now fresh or stale randomness? To make the question well defined, suppose that we mean the temperature at a specific place and round it off to the nearest degree. The answer would be a probability distribution, a different distribution in the summer than in the winter, but is it really fresh randomness? It's hard to imagine any extension of our current technology that would enable us to make accurate weather forecasts one year in advance, but in a hundred years from now, who knows what kind of unimaginable technology will exist, assuming that the human race is still around. And again, one could argue, even if we can't forecast the temperature a year from now, isn't it nevertheless something that's already determined? I think it's an interesting philosophical question whether we should think of these as fresh randomness. Maybe it's just an illusion. I don't claim to know the answer. All this discussion is a lead-in to the question that I really want to discuss, which is, what happens if a qubit in the plus state is measured? Is the outcome of that fresh randomness or stale randomness? In the quantum information framework that has been the subject of this course, we've thought of it as fresh randomness. It doesn't really make sense in our model for Alice to produce a plus state and at the same time to know in advance the outcome of a future measurement of that state. Or does it? Let's explore the possibility that the outcomes of measuring a qubit in the plus state are predetermined. Suppose that lurking within the qubit is a table of outcomes. We can think of it this way. Think of a qubit as a physical entity, a particle, technically a spin one-half particle, created at the Big Bang. At that time, a predetermined outcome for each possible measurement is inserted into a table that's stored within the particle. For example, for a measurement in the computational basis, the outcome is a random bit. So a random bit is inserted into that entry of the table. On the other hand, for a measurement in the plus minus basis, the outcome should always be the first state. So that entry of the table is filled with the bit zero. 
And for every other potential measurement, there is an entry in the table containing a bit that is sampled with the appropriate probability distribution for that measurement. That's a lot of information. Maybe there's a compressed way of containing this information, but let's not concern ourselves with that issue. My point is that it's conceivable that the particle contains this table of predetermined measurement outcomes stored within it. In physics, these are called hidden variables. The idea is that there are additional physical properties of systems that are yet to be discovered. When they are discovered, quantum mechanics will be tamed of its randomness. The randomness that arises in quantum theory now could merely be a reflection of the fact that we don't know what these hidden variables are. So a measurement produces the predetermined value from the output table. What about applying a unitary operation? This would rearrange the table of outcomes in some systematic way. For example, the effect of a Hadamard transform would swap the first two bits of the table, because after applying a Hadamard to this state, the state becomes cat zero. So now, measuring in the computational basis produces zero for sure, and measuring in the plus minus basis is what produces a random bit. And in this picture, every spin one-half particle has its own separate table. If multiple particles are in the plus state, then each one contains an independent random bit for the first entry in its table of outcomes. This is consistent with what happens when we measure several qubits that are each in the plus state. What's interesting about this hidden variables picture is that, so far, everything is consistent with quantum behavior. Let's continue exploring how a hidden variable model would work. Imagine a two qubit or two particle system and two measurements that we'll refer to as M0 and M1. We're supposing that each particle contains its table of outcomes. Here, we'll only care about the parts of the tables that are associated with the measurements M0 and M1. Call the predetermined values for the first particle A0 and A1. Call the predetermined values for the second particle B0 and B1. Assume that the particles will be measured and the measurements will be space-like separated events. Therefore, when the first particle is measured, information about which measurement is performed on the second particle is unavailable to the first particle. And similarly, when the second particle is measured, information about which measurement is performed on the first particle is unavailable to the second particle. For the Bell inequality, it is more convenient to think of the bit values as plus one and minus one instead of zero and one. We can perform the conversion like this. Zero gets converted to plus one, and 1 gets converted to minus 1. And we use uppercase letters for the converted bits. So each uppercase letter is either plus 1 or minus 1. I claim that this inequality holds, which is called the CHSH inequality. Note that each of the four terms on the left side can be plus 1 or minus 1. So we might imagine that the left side can be as large as 4, but the upper bound is 2. Let's see how to prove this. We can write the left side like this. Now, consider the expressions in the parentheses, b0 plus b1 and b0 minus b1. b0 and b1 either have the same sign or different signs. If b0 and b1 have the same sign, then b0 plus b1 can be as large as 2, but b0 minus b1 is 0. So in that case, the upper bound is 2. If b0 and b1 have different signs, then b0 minus b1 can be as large as 2, but then b0 plus b1 is 0. 
So in that case, the upper bound is also two. That's how the CHSH inequality is proved. By the way, the original inequality along these lines is due to John Bell. All subsequent variations of it are called Bell inequalities. This particularly nice version is due to Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt, and is also called the CHSH inequality. So why should we care about this inequality? First of all, let's consider the question whether one could in principle design an experiment to verify this inequality. What do you think? You may pause to think about this. There's actually some subtlety with this question. The first and simplest answer is no, because only one of the four AB terms in the inequality can be measured. Here are the particles with their outcome tables, where I've taken the liberty of writing the outcomes with uppercase A's and B's in the plus one minus one language. You can choose to perform any one measurement on the first system and get A0 or A1, but not both. And you can choose any one measurement on the second system and get B0 or B1, but not both. So you can only get one AS times BT term, which is plus one or minus one. To verify the inequality, you need to see all four terms. But a second answer is yes. The inequality can be verified, albeit indirectly, by statistical means. To understand how, consider what happens if you choose bits s and t randomly and generate the quantity minus 1 to the st asbt. You can acquire as and bt by performing measurements. What's the expected value of minus 1 to the st asbt? It's this expression. Does it look familiar? It's the left side of the CHSH inequality divided by 4. So we know from the CHSH inequality that this expectation is upper bounded by 1 half. Now, here's the experiment. Make many separate runs of the procedure where you pick a random ST and then measure MS and MT to sample minus 1 to the ST ASBT for a pair of particles. When S and T are both 1, you put a minus sign in front of the product. The average over many runs will converge to 1 half or less. So there's an experiment that statistically verifies that the CHSH inequality holds. This is remarkable because quantum systems can violate the CHSH inequality. Suppose that two qubits are entangled in a Bell state. Consider what happens if a rotation is performed on each qubit. It's a fairly straightforward exercise to check that the result is this state. Notice that the ket00 and ket11 corresponds to outcomes where the signs of A and B are the same. So the product of A and B is plus one and ket01 and ket10 correspond to the outcomes where the signs of a and b are different, so the product of a and b is minus 1. So if after the two rotations are performed, the qubits are measured, the probability that a b is plus 1 is the co-squared of the sum of the two rotation angles, and the probability that a b is minus 1 is the sine squared of the sum of the two rotation angles. Now consider these two measurements. M0 means rotate by minus pi over 16, and then measure in the computational basis. M1 means rotate by plus 3 pi over 16, 
and then measure in the computational basis. Let's look at the various angles that arise. When M0 is performed on both sides, the total rotation angle is minus pi over 8. When M0 is performed on one side and M1 on the other side, the total rotation angle is plus pi over 8. And when M1 is performed on both sides, the total rotation angle is 3 pi over 8. This means that the expected value of the product of the measurement outcomes, AB, in the case where at least one of the two measurements is M0, is the cos squared of plus or minus pi over 8 minus the sine squared of plus or minus pi over 8. And with a little trigonometric calculation, this evaluates to 1 half times the square root of 2. And in the case where both measurements are m1, the expected value of minus the product of the outcomes ab is this, which also evaluates to 1 half times the square root of 2. This means that the bound of 1 half for the expression in the CHSH inequality is violated by a factor of root 2. So what would happen if we perform the aforementioned experiment of repeatedly picking a random ST and measuring to sample minus 1 to the ST ASBT? The average would exceed the bound of 1 half that was derived under the assumption of local hidden variables. Therefore, in the quantum information framework, local hidden variables cannot exist. Let's summarize the Bell inequality and its violation. Assuming that the measurement outcomes of quantum systems are predetermined by local hidden variables leads to the Bell inequality. But actual quantum systems violate this inequality by a factor of root 2. Therefore, quantum systems cannot be based on such hidden variables. And this behavior of quantum systems has been experimentally verified. The rough idea is to generate two particles in a Bell state and send them out in opposite directions to reach detectors, which are set in various ways. Now let's look at the Bell CHSH inequality in a different way, as a non-local game, like the ones I showed you in the previous lecture. Consider a game where Alice and Bob each receive input bits, call them S and T, and they must produce output bits, call them a and B. The rules of the game are that there is no communication allowed between the players once the game starts, and the players win if and only if A, X, or B is equal to S and T. This equation is just a condensed way of specifying this table. When the inputs are 0 and 0, the X or of the two output bits should be 0 and the same for the cases of inputs 0, 1, and 1, 0. But for the case where the input bits are both 1, the XOR of the output bits should be 1. So what's the best strategy for this game that uses classical information? Why don't you pause now to think about this? Any classical strategy can succeed with probability at most three quarters. This can be shown along the lines of the proof in the previous lecture that the best classical success probability of the GHZ game is three quarters. We can summarize the winning conditions in terms of four equations, and at most three of those four equations can be satisfied. What's the best success probability possible by an entangled strategy? Please pause to think about this. 
it's the cos squared of pi over 8, which is around 85%. And this is achieved with one Bell state of entanglement. So this is in the spirit of the non-local games, like GHZ and Magic Square in the previous lecture, except the entangled strategy is not perfect. It does not achieve success probability 1, but it does achieve a higher success probability than possible without entanglement. Now I'll show you how the entangled strategy works. It's going to look very familiar. It uses this Bell state. And note that applying rotations to each qubit results in this state. Notice that ket00 and ket11 correspond to measurement outcomes AB, where AX or B is 0. And ket01 and ket10 correspond to outcomes where a, x, or b is 1. Alice's strategy is to look at her input bit s, and if s is 0, she applies a rotation by minus pi over 16. If s is 1, she applies a rotation by 3 pi over 16. Bob's strategy is similar with respect to his input t. Now, let's look at the various rotation angles. When st is 0, 0, the net rotation is by minus pi over 8. When st is 0, 1, or 1, 0, the net rotation is by plus pi over 8. And when st is 1, 1, the net rotation is by 3 pi over 8. The success probability in the 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0 cases is the cos squared of plus or minus pi over 8, which is around 85%. The success probability in the 1, 1 case is the sine squared of 3 pi over 8, which is the same quantity. This non-local game is essentially equivalent to the CHSH inequality, but expressed in a different language. Bell inequalities and non-local games can be thought of as different ways of expressing the same ideas about non-locality. Let's end the lecture now.